welcome everyone. My name is Jing Liu. I'm the Managing Director of the Michigan Institute for Data Science. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to just mention a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, the next two seminars are coming up in the next two weeks. One of them is uh, Sabina Leonelli on uh, Big Data and Open Science. Uh, one is Damon Woodard on uh, biometrics, identity, and cyberspace. I want to particularly mention actually uh, the event next Wednesday, which is a Responsible Data Science and AI mini symposium in the afternoon of April 8th, uh, April 6th. This is part of our Future Leader Summit um, and um, will feature five speakers who are all prominent data scientists. So I encourage all of you to check out our website and register for the mini symposium. I also want to thank our uh, corporate partners who sponsor our seminar series and other events throughout the year. Uh, American Mathematical Society, China Scope, General Dynamics, Microsoft, Rocket Companies, and Yazaki. So now I'd like to turn to today's uh, seminar. We're really happy today to have uh, Matthew Soganik from Princeton University. Matthew is professor of sociology and also the director of the Center for Information Technology Policy. He's also affiliated with several of Princeton's interdisciplinary research centers, including the Office of Population Research and the Center for Statistics and Machine Learning. His research falls into the broad areas of computational social science, and social networks. His publications have won twice the Outstanding Article Award from the Mathematical Socio Sociology section of the American Sociological Association and the Outstanding Statistical Application Award from the American Statistical Association. He also recently published the book, Bit by Bit, Social Research in the Digital Age. Popular accounts of his work have appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, The Economist, and The New Yorker. Um, so he's been uh, meeting with our faculty members today and tomorrow um, about uh, this line of research with which is really capturing the, uh, the enthusiasm of a lot of the uh, social science and um, related research. So his talk today is titled the, the Unpredictability of Life Outcomes. So now I would pass it down to Matthew, please share your slide and take it from here. And also I want to mention for the audience members, you uh, feel free to put all your questions in the Q&A anytime during the talk. Uh, clarif clarifying questions we might deal with uh, during the talk, other questions will most likely wait till the end of the talk. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here virtually. Uh, I wish I could be there in person, um, but it, this is, uh, anyway, these are crazy times and I look forward to visiting Ann Arbor sometime soon. Um, today I wanna share some of my work with you. Um, so can everyone see this slide? Is it, did it change? Yes. All right, I will 41. just, good, perfect. So this slide, um, my field is sociology. I know we potentially have an interdisciplinary audience here. And this is a very simple uh, summary of a lot of research in sociology in a subfield called stratification, which is largely about trying to figure out what kinds of things happen to different kinds of people. So a lot of stratification research can be reduced to an equation like this, where we have a Y, which is often an outcome. Uh, whoop. Uh, we often call this outcome attainment, and that could be things like academic achievement, your occupation or your income. And then what we often do is we model this attainment outcome with some predictable component. Um, um, so often this predictable component takes the form of a regression. Uh, and so here we might say something like, uh, women earn less than men, even after we adjust for their levels of education. That would be an example of a kind of claim you would make about the predictable component. And we spend all of our time and all of our theories focusing on this predictable component. 
Then there is this unpredictable component, the error term over here, which we largely ignore and pretend doesn't exist. However, if you look at it, despite the fact that all of our theories focus on the predictable component, empirically, it's the unpredictable component that dominates. And so what we wanted to do in this research is try to understand why that is, like paying attention to the thing that we all know is out there and all like to ignore. So let's try to understand this unpredictable component. How small can we make it? And also, where does it actually come from? So and this kind of work is a little bit different than what we normal see, normally see in social science research and in some ways is more aligned with what we often see in computer science. And so one way to think about that is this distinction between Y hat style research and beta hat style research. So in a talk in a sociology department, you predominantly see beta hat style research. That is the talk largely focuses on a, a uh, there'll be some theory, there'll be a discussion of some data, then there'll be some kind of regression model and the talk will hinge on the coefficient, the beta hat coefficient and whether that is different than zero or not. In machine learning research and data science, we often see much more of a focus on Y hats or the ability to make predictions. So for example, we might see a focus on whether an email is spam or not spam. And so, both of these approaches are very powerful, uh, but also both of them are really incomplete. So if you think about a regression equation, it is Y hats and it is beta hats, and we should focus on both of these. And so we sometimes now see a focus on the um, bringing the beta hats into Y hat style research with like interpretable machine learning. And I think, an, increasingly we're gonna see bringing more Y hat style research into beta hat style research. So bringing prediction into social science. And so one way to think about what this talk is gonna be is it's gonna be Y hat research in the service of beta hat. So we're doing prediction, but not because prediction is an end in itself, but because we care about using prediction as a way to build understanding. So, any talk about predictability in the social sciences, the, one of the first things that normally happens is that people say they don't actually care about prediction, at least social scientists. And as I was describing this to a colleague, he said, Matt, you know, we're not trying to be weather forecasters. Uh, to which I replied, well, actually, I kind of like weather forecasters. I think they do some valuable stuff. Um, but uh, I think as social scientists, we really should care about the predictability of social outcomes. And I think there's really two different broad categories of reasons we should. One is scientific reasons. So first, predictability of social outcomes is a basic social fact that varies across time and across space. So if I can tell you everything about the life of a child based on the circumstances into which that child was born, that tells you something very important about that society. There's also good reason to be interested in predictability as a means of encouraging scientific discovery. That is in the quest for improving predictability, we can develop new theories, improve our methods of data collection. There are also very important policy reasons to be focused on predictability. This is a, a picture of a New York Times Magazine article about what's happening in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. This is uh, basically Pittsburgh. And so there the child protective service system is using a machine learning model trained on administrative data to produce risk scores uh, about whether families will be uh, committing child abuse and neglect. So this is a very controversial thing. Some people say, this is great. The child protective services system needs to make use of the best data it can. And, and we can hopefully improve these things by using this data. Other people think this is incredibly terrible uh, because there's a potential that these systems can mitigate his, uh, can perpetuate historical biases. So sometimes you hear the expression bias in, bias out. Um, these are very important debates to be having, but I think they leave out an even more basic question, which is how accurately can we predict what will happen to individual families? What kinds of data do we need to make those accurate predictions? And what kinds of techniques allow us to make those predictions? So right now, policymakers are having to decide whether to do this stuff or not. 
but they lack a lot of the basic scientific understanding because we have not, as researchers, have not provided it for them. So I think we really need to start caring about the predictability of social outcomes. So what I'm gonna talk about today is one uh, project that's now finished, the Fragile Families Challenge, and then two projects that are currently ongoing. So this is a work in progress, and I'd love to get your feedback on all of this work. So the first project I'm gonna tell you about is the Fragile Families Challenge. So this project builds on work that my colleague Sarah McClanahan and others have done here at Princeton over the last 20 years. Uh, they've collected this study called the Fragile Family and Child Wellbeing Study. It's a birth cohort study. So they sampled about 5,000 children who were born in 20 US cities, and they had an oversample of non-marital births. Marriage is where the mother and father aren't related. Then they followed these families over time, collecting data from them at when the child was born, and then at increasing intervals as the child ages. It's trying to understand the dynamics of these families and the kids that are born into them. This data is widely used in my field. It's already been used in hundreds of papers and dozens of dissertations. So when I got involved in this project, this is how a social scientist might think about the fragile families data. So there are five different waves of data collection when the kid was born, one, three, five, and nine. And then there are different modules of data collection. So for example, they did a survey of the mother, they did a survey of the father. There was an in-home assessment where they went to the home and systematically recorded the characteristics of the environment, like whether there was graffiti outside of the house, whether there was exposed electrical outlets inside of the house. As the child aged, they also interviewed the child and child's teachers and child care providers. So it's a very rich data set trying to capture many things about the life of the child. So when I actually got more engaged in this, the data set looked like this, which is the data from birth year nine was publicly available. And as I said, it had been used in hundreds of papers, but the data that was collected when the children were 15 years old had been collected, but it was not yet publicly available. And so this moment where we have data collected, but not yet publicly available is actually an amazing, amazing research opportunity for people who wanna study predictability. And I wanna emphasize this, exact opportunity exists in every single longitudinal study. There are many, many longitudinal studies happening all over the world. Every single one of them has this exact same opportunity. And let me tell you more about what that opportunity is. And to see that opportunity, I think it helps to look at this data more like a data scientist. And so a data scientist might look at the data this way. Uh, this way, there we go. Um, so we have thousands of families um, here. We have a big matrix. If you stitch together all the information that we've collected about these families, you end up with about 13,000 variables that were collected between birth and age nine. And then this data is available. And then we have this data over here, the data at age 15 that's collected, but not yet available. And when you see something like this, it creates an opportunity to do a project using the common task method. And so what we did is we picked six variables at age 15 that we wanted people to try to predict. So one of those variables is the grade point average or the GPA of the students. Then half of the students were put into this training set. And so researchers had access to this background data and this training data, and then they could build a model to try to predict the grades of any of these students. And then they had to use that model to predict held out data. So there are two kinds of held out data, the leaderboard data and the holdout data. The leaderboard data was available during the challenge while it was going on. And I'm not gonna talk more about that today. I wanna focus on the holdout data. This is data that we had and we kept hidden until the end of the challenge. And so researchers could use any technique they wanted. They could use any machine learning technique. They could use any social science theory. They could use any combination of these things to try to predict what's gonna be in the holdout data. Now this research design, the common task method, it's very common in computer science. It's not very common at all in the social sciences. And to me, this is a huge lost opportunity because this is a very powerful research design for learning about predictability. So just like experiments are a powerful research design for learning about causal inference, for learning about causality, the common task method is a very powerful methodology for learning about predictability. And so 
what we can do is we can have many people participate and have them all try to predict this held out data. And then we can see who can predict it the best. And that is a very credible estimate of the best possible predictability. If the estimate is higher than you expect, you can't really explain it away based on overfitting, researcher degrees of freedom, p-hacking, these kinds of things, because the researcher has no control over the design and the data is purely held out. Um, second, if the estimates are lower than you expect, you can't explain this away based on the failure of any particular research group. So for example, if uh, I tried to build a model to predict GPA and I didn't do a very good job, you might say, oh, Matt, that's because you don't know about this kind of ML technique or that kind of thing. And maybe, but if many teams of researchers try it and none of them can do it, that argument becomes much less compelling. So by having many people work together on the same task, we're, uh, and we're able to produce very credible estimates of predictability. So this is the setup that we had during the Fragile Families Challenge. We had six outcomes that we selected with domain experts, that is people who studied the life course and the family. So I'll tell you what those six outcomes are now. So we had two outcomes that were about the child, the GPA, which is their grades, and their grit, which is their material, uh, their like a passion and perseverance. It's a psychological measure. Some of the outcomes were properties of the household, whether the household was evicted and how much material hardship the household experienced. So material hardship is like a measure of the experience of poverty. Poverty is defined by your income. Material hardship is defined by your experience. It's made up of experiences like not having enough food to eat, um, not being able to go to the doctor because you couldn't afford it and so on. Uh, finally, the third, some of the outcomes were about the primary caregiver. This is usually the mother, but not always, sometimes the father, sometimes uh, a grandparent. And so whether the primary caregiver had job training or job loss. So you see we have outcome variables that are some about the child, some about the household, some about the primary caregiver, some are continuous and some are binary. So we had then we encouraged other researchers to participate in the Fragile Families Challenge, and we had 457 researchers apply to get access to the data. And we have a discussion of the privacy and ethics audit that we did in the paper listed there. Many of these researchers work in interdisciplinary teams, and the goal was to make a prediction that minimizes the mean squared error in the holdout set. So here, the goal is completely focused on predictability, and we wanted to see how accurately we could make researchers could make predictions using any technique that they wanted and using this rich high quality data set collected since the birth of the child. So this is the big question here is using a large high quality social science data set collected since birth and modern machine learning methods, how well can we predict outcomes for uh, children, parents and families? And I'm gonna present some results to you in terms of this R squared holdout metric, which is the R squared in the holdout data, not the data that was used to train the data, uh, held out data. And what this is, is it's the squared error of the model made by the participant, um, divided, normalized by the squared error that you would get if you submitted just the mean of the training data. So this is kind of like a null model. Uh, so if the mean uh, GPA in the training data is 2.87 and, and you submit 2.87 for everyone, how much is your prediction how does your prediction do compared to that? And then we do one minus this. So there's two benchmarks that are important to think about here. An R squared holdout of one is perfectly accurate predictions. An R squared holdout of zero is no better than using the mean of the training data. So it's basically like a non-prediction. And so the question is, how? what's the answer? How well using this data set and modern machine learning methods, how well can people predict? So normally when I give this talk, I like to have a show of hands um, where people vote what they think the predictability will be for these outcomes. Unfortunately, on a, on a webinar style like this, we can't do that. Um, I'd like everyone to just think for a minute about what they think the result would be. Again, zero is no more accurate than the mean of the training data. One is perfectly accurate. And here are the results. So the R squared holdouts are about 0.2 for material hardship and GPA and about zero for the other variables. So in other words, 
the predictions are not very accurate. Uh, here's a way a social scientist might look at this result. Here's actually, I think, a better way to look at this result, which is to rescale it to focus on the fact that the predictions can go anywhere from zero to one. And we see that all of those 13,000 variables that Sarah and her colleagues have been collecting, and these are variables that are designed to be used for research. These are the things that they think are the most important things happening in these kids' lives. All of that plus state-of-the-art machine learning gives you these blue bars. So the dominant pattern here is this vast white space. And so the big question is what is in this vast white space? So this project was a scientific mass collaboration. It would not have been possible. The credibility of this result rests in part on the fact that many, many teams participated. Um, this paper uh, describing this result has 112 authors. You can check it out. Um, we also, in the spirit of mass collaboration, wanted to give everyone that participated a chance to write about their, their own approach to this problem. And so Sarah and I were the spe uh, special uh, editors of an issue, a special issue of the journal Socius, which is a new open access journal from the American Sociological Association. So 12 teams from the challenge wrote papers in the special issue. Uh, and all of those papers are accompanied by code and a computing environment. So the results are computationally reproducible. We also have three papers from our group about the problems that we ran into during the challenge to hopefully make this kind of work easier for other people. So they include the privacy and ethics, some stuff about survey metadata infrastructure and challenges with computational reproducibility. So that's it for the Fragile Families Challenge. And what I wanna do now is talk about two new research projects with some very preliminary results. Maybe this is a time to pause and Jing or James, are there any questions that came up before I move on to the newer stuff? No, you can move on. Okay. Great. So again, this is I, the main finding from the challenge. That is, these outcomes are not very predictable uh, despite using high quality social science data and state-of-the-art machine learning. Um, one thing that we're doing now is trying to understand. So if you look at this, um, there are many possible reasons why this might be the case. So some people might say, oh, GPA is a property of the kid. Maybe properties of the kids are more predictable than properties of the households or material hardship is measured with a scale. Maybe things that are measured with a scale are more predictable than things that are measured with a single question. So you can come up with six different data points. You can come up with um, any possible number of explanations that fit these six data points. And so if we wanna take the study of predictability seriously, we need to measure the predictability of lots of different outcomes so that we can start looking for patterns in predictability. And so for that, we're doing, this is joint work with Emily Cantrell and Pranay Anchuri. We're doing a simulated mass collaboration to predict all of the year 15 variables, all that, let's say roughly a thousand different outcomes. And so what happened during the challenge Everyone who participated agreed to open source their predictions and open source their code as part of participating in the challenge. So we've created this very rich set of artifacts where that we can use as a building block for future research. And so what we've done is we've seen there are certain kinds of patterns. Everyone approached the challenge differently, but there are certain common patterns that we see. So many of the approaches, uh, and so what we've done is we've tried to implement all of those approaches. And so now we have uh, this infrastructure to build thousands of different machine learning pipelines that could have been used in the challenge. And then we want to use these pipelines to predict the thousands of a thousand different outcomes uh, in year 15 to find the patterns in these outcomes. So we're calling this project the Million Monkeys Project, inspired by this idea of millions of monkeys tapping away, hopefully uh, producing the works of Shakespeare. This is a whole different talk. I'd be delighted to share more about that project later. Um, so we have this one kind of high throughput machine learning style project to try to understand the results from the Fragile Families Challenge. And what I wanna spend the bulk of the time on today is a different project. And again, motivated by this same result, what is going on in this vast white space? 
we're trying to understand the origins of this unpredictability. And we're doing this not through more machine learning and more predictive modeling. We're doing it through a very different technique. Um, we're doing it through in-depth interviews with the kids and their families. And so I've often said to my colleagues in data science, like, do you know any data science technique that can help us find important and unmeasured variables in our data set? And they say, no, we don't have any way of finding unmeasured variables. And I say, well, we have a way in sociology, it's called talking to people. And so I partnered with um, Kathy and Tim, our uh, colleagues in my department, uh, who have a lot of experience doing this kind of in-depth interview research, a number of graduate students as well, working on this project with us. And so, uh, and Susan also is a, a colleague um, in a different university. So we're all working together to find the origins of this unpredictability by doing in-depth interviews with the kids and their families. So we have in-depth semi-structured interviews with the young adult and the primary caregiver. We interviewed them separately with the hope that this would lead us to more accurate information. If you're asking a kid about their life in front of their parent, that may not be the best strategy. Uh, we interviewed about 40 families spread over three different cities. These were life history interviews. So we focused, and in doing these interviews, we were focused on three specific time periods. The period from birth to year nine is the period during which the survey was in the field. So these are variables that we could have potentially measured, but maybe did not. Then from nine to 15 is stuff after the survey measurement had been complete before the outcome had occurred. So there's really everything that happens in this nine to 15 window, there's no way we could have measured that, but potentially important things are happening during that window. Then 15 plus after the outcome has occurred, this then information has not no relevance to the fragile family challenge directly, but it is still revealing important things about the lives of these kids. So the interviews were focused on these three periods. We had two interviewers in each team. One of the interviewers was blind to the outcome. So for example, that interviewer did not know um, what the predicted GPA was and what the actual GPA was. The other interviewer did know. So we, we thought a lot about whether we want to do this blinded or unblinded because the advantage of being unblinded is naturally you can probe in your interview about certain things that seem to be particularly relevant to the outcome that occurred. The disadvantage of this obviously is you're probing for confirmatory evidence in a way that may lead you to kind of fool yourself. And so we came up with this hybrid design where the interview is done by a blinded interviewer. And then at the end, the the person who doesn't know the outcome turns to the other person and asks, are there any other questions that you think we should discuss? And then the unblinded person takes over and is able to probe about um, specific issues that might be especially important given what had happened. So uh, this, this is a sample design. Everyone in the three cities had a, everyone in the holdout set from these three cities had a non-zero probability of selection, but we oversampled uh, people with very large residuals. So we oversampled kids who are doing much better than expected because we wanna figure out what is helping these kids beat the odds. Uh, we also oversampled kids who are doing much worse than expected because we wanted to see what is causing these kids to struggle unexpectedly. So just to highlight one high level summary is we did not just find a single missing variable that explains everything. I think this should be um, this should be your expectation, given that they already collected 13,000 variables. It's unlikely that there is a magic 13,000 and first variable, but I just want to get that out very clearly. And I want to talk more about what we did find. Um, so one of the things we found is that our even our way of asking questions about predictability was not very sharp and not very precise. So we started off with a very simple question of like, how predictable is some outcome? And we quickly realized this is not a precise enough way of asking the question. So then we moved to, you could imagine asking a different question, like, sorry, there we go. Uh, how predictable is this outcome at time C given a set of predictors X measured from times A to B and a sample size of N. Now we're starting to get to a much more precise question. And this kind of question, question number two, this is one that can be answered using the common task method. So you have a bunch of data and you have people try to make these kind of predictions. What we're really interested in in this project is this third question, which is how predictable is some outcome Y measured at time C given any possible predictors 
measured from times A to B and any possible sample size. So as you can see, we're talking about things that don't exist here. Any possible sample size, any possible predictors. So naturally, there's going to be a lot of extrapolation going on here. So I want to be clear about the difference between question two, which I think can be answered very clearly using the common task method, and question three, which is necessarily going to involve some modeling and speculation. All right, so the way we did this is we did all these interviews and then we read the interviews and discussed them within our research group. And we inductively settled into a conceptual framework that I'm gonna share with you now. But I wanna be clear, this is not like this was pre-registered. This is not what we were setting out to find. Um, qualitative researchers often talk about this inductive process of research. And this is very clearly an inductive process in this particular piece of work. Um, so, we now think about it in the following way, that prediction error has two distinct origins. Uh, and one of those origins is irreducible error and the other is learning error. And I wanna now explain to you what these two sources of error are. So imagine we have some subpopulation um, where some predictor with some, uh, these are the outcomes for everyone in this particular subgroup with a particular set of uh, covariates. So this is the mean of the outcomes. This could be, for example, GPA of all boys in a school. So right here, we already have some irreducible error, which is that even if you make the best possible prediction for everyone within that subgroup, um, the, not, the predictions are not gonna be perfectly accurate because there is this within group variance. So you can't do any better than this when you have within group variance. So there is this irreducible error. Likewise, imagine if you take a sample, so this is a sample of boys, and your sample mean might actually be different than the true subgroup mean. And so that gives you learning error. And so we think these two components are distinct, the irreducible error and the learning error. And what we're gonna do is talk about the social and measurement processes that can lead to irreducible error and learning error. So, Here's how this would look in a case more like what we're used to, where we would have, let's say, uh, a model that's trying to produce these subgroup means. So within each of these subgroups, we have irreducible error. We can take a sample from these subgroups and then make an OLS prediction for the value of each of these subgroups. And you can see that there's learning error here and irreducible error. And so it turns out that there is a mathematical decomposition of the prediction error into these two components. So there is the irreducible error. You can roughly think about this as the, the kind of within group variability. And then there's also the learning error. This is roughly our ability for our predicted value for each subgroup to be close to the true mean of that subgroup. These are the two different sources of error. This is a mathematical decomposition that is kind of all sources of error fall into this category one uh, into this decomposition. One way that you can think about what kinds of things fall into which group would be that as the sample size goes to infinity, the learning error will go to zero, but the irreducible error will stay forever. I also wanna emphasize all of our focus on machine learning to do social science tasks. That really focuses on reducing the learning error. The machine learning cannot reduce the irreducible error. The irreducible error you'll see in this equation, the irreducible error does not even have a component for the prediction. The irreducible error is a property of the amount of within group variability that you have in your data. So from these interviews, we came up with this kind of following schematic. So I talked about the, the prediction error is equal to the irreducible error plus the learning error. And now I wanna to talk to you about some of the processes that we saw that lead to irreducible error and learning error. So now I'm gonna tell you some stories from these interviews to help illustrate some of these ideas. So the first source of irreducible error uh, that we found is what we call consequential intervening events. So let me give you an example. One of the families in our study, there was a mother and a father and two kids. Then between the ages of nine, after the age nine interview, the father passed away unexpectedly and the mother became depressed. And this is um, what the child said to us. When he passed away, she checked out she was depressed, she was in her own world, then my brother and I were in our own world, it wasn't really a relationship. 
So this child had a predicted GPA of 3.06. This is before the father passed away and before the mother became depressed. The child's actual GPA was 1.5. So substantially worse, um, likely because of this consequential intervening events, which happened after the data was collected. So one way that you can think about this is we have predictors measured from time A to B, in our case, birth to year nine. Then we have some outcome measured at time C. To the extent that there are things that happen between nine and 15 that are both hard to predict and consequential for outcomes, that's gonna create a limit to the best possible predictions that we can make. The most extreme example of this would be something like getting struck by lightning, which is very hard to predict based on any variable that we can measure about a person or winning the lottery. Again, very hard to measure. So to the extent that there, and these both can have big impacts on lots of different outcomes, getting struck by lightning or winning the lottery. So we did not interview anyone who got struck by lightning or won the lottery, but there are many events that have this similar feel, uh, like this example of the unexpected death in the family that leads to this kind of cascading series of problems. So to the extent that there are consequential intervening events, it will be hard to predict what will happen at time C based on what's happening between times A and B. Second source of problems, uh, origin of irreducible error is measurement error. Measurement error is something that has many different meanings in many different communities. Um, one kind of problem that you can see is misreporting of predictors. And so what this can mean is that people who end up kind of in the wrong subgroup, and then that leads to variation, more variation than we would want within the subgroup because people are not in the right subgroup. You can also have misreporting of outcomes or more subtly a measurement problem in the outcome. So if you're trying to predict, let's say what someone will get on the SAT and the, what someone gets on the SAT varies from replication to replication, then the measurement error in that outcome creates a limit on how accurately you can predict something. Like if you can't measure it accurately and consistently, it's gonna be hard to predict it consistently. Uh, but what I wanna talk about most now is another kind of thing that's not actually an measurement error in the sense that someone is not giving you the right, what you're asking for. Um, it's course measurement where the respondent is answering accurately, but our measurement process still creates this kind of error. So let me give you an example of a court problem caused by course measurement. This is one of the questions in the survey. How close do you feel to your mom? Would you say you are extremely close, quite close, fairly close, or not very close? So for those of you who are social scientists, you recognize questions like these. I wanna tell you now a story about one of the uh, kids who answered not very close. And what you'll see is that there's not very close could mean a lot of different things. So this person actually, it wasn't that she was not close to her mother, it's that she and her mother had a terrible relationship. Uh, we always bickered and fought. I caught myself begging for my mom, mom, I need you. And she was just like, she blatantly ignored me. Uh, her mom told her, you better start treating me better because I might not live that long. I could, then this plausibly impacted the youth performance in school. She said, I couldn't even focus in class. I was shaking. That was all I could think about. I was like crying in school. And they, the school staff had no idea what was wrong with me. So she correctly answered, of these choices, she is not very close to her mom. But that is not fully capturing the nature of the relationship that she has with her mom. So her predicted GPA was 2.71. Her actual GPA was 1.25. Plausibly, this could be because of her relationship with her mother. So this is an example of course measurement. Often in social science, we have continuous um, constructs, like how close you are to your mother. Uh, and we often measure these in categories. So you might say everyone whose measure of closeness is below this cut point, they will respond not very close. And if it's the case that the actual outcome varies along this continuous trait and we only measure a coarse version of that continuous trait that can create within group variability. And that leads to this irreducible error. So I wanna focus now on a third source of that leads to irreducible error. And this is unmeasured predictors. So one of the first things that people see, think of when they see the results from the challenge is, oh, maybe there's like just a lot of things that you weren't measuring. And Maybe, but I wanna clarify, this changes the prediction task. Like now, as we add in new variables, we are really changing the question we're asking. We're, 
any question we make about predictability has to be conditional on the data that we're used to making that prediction. So as we change the data that's used to make the prediction, we're changing the question. And so we did find two common types of variables that seem to be missing. As I said, there wasn't one single missed variable, but there were things that seemed to be important in individual cases and they can, they somewhat fall into two buckets. One is out of study people and the other is questions that are out of the dynamic range of the instrument. And I wanna to talk to you about each of these uh, because I also wanna be clear that I think these are not just, um, oh, if the research group had thought more carefully, they could have done these things. These are kind of fundamental problems that are not resolvable using existing measurement technology with the budgets that we normally have. So out of study people, um, these are people who import, are important in the life of the kid, um, but who are not actually captured in the interview process and who are not interviewed. So imagine I told you that I wanted to predict what was gonna happen to a kid only based on data about that kid. You would say, oh, that doesn't make sense, Matt. Like you need to know about, surely you need to know about their parents. So I said, okay, well, let's imagine we interviewed their parents. Then you would say, well, surely you need to know about their teachers. And so the Fragile Family Study interviewed their teachers. So the Fragile Family Study built out data collection around the focal child. But one of the things that we learned is that many children have many people who impact their life. And these people are often not interviewed in studies and they're not often defined very clearly by important relationships. So this picture of blueberries has to do with one of the kids in our study who uh, her, she was often taken care of by a neighbor she called Miss Marge, who would often give her breakfast. Her mother had to leave early for work and Miss Marge would often give her blueberries for breakfast. Miss Marge is not captured anywhere in the survey. Her predicted GPA was three point, about 3.0. Her actual GPA was 3.75. This is potentially because of this influence of this unmeasured predictor, uh, Mrs. Marge, this, this person who had an important role in their life, who was not in the study. And social network research suggests that we interact with hundreds of people, any, any one of whom could have an important impact on our lives. Um, but it's very difficult. It's not really even possible for us to reliably measure information about everyone around a single focal respondent using the kinds of survey techniques that we use and within the scope of budgets we normally have for our studies. So the second kind of source of unmeasured predictors uh, is things that are what we call outside of the dynamic range of the survey. So I wanna explain what I mean here. So there are certain microphones that are designed to pick up high frequency sounds. There are certain microphones that are designed to pick up low frequency sounds. Every kind of microphone has a kind of target dynamic range. And I also think it's true that surveys have a target dynamic range. So this fragile family study was an uh, oversample of non-marital births. And so the study itself focused largely on the experience of disadvantaged people living in cities. And that is the bulk of the sample. So there are a number of questions that would be very, very relevant to this population, but the population is actually much more heterogeneous than that. So we had one kid in the study who lives in a small town with a very prestigious university. And he says, the majority of people that live in my hometown live there because their parents are professors or because their dad works at the hospital or their parents are engineers. I think 50% of all parents in my high schools have PhDs. So this is not something that the researchers collected because for many of the people in the study, this was not a relevant question. How many of the parents of your peers have PhDs? For almost everyone in the study, the answer would have been zero. And so in this case, they didn't ask it because they didn't think it was, it was outside of the dynamic range of the instrument. And in this case, this kid was predicted to have a very high GPA and actually had a much higher one, potentially because the kinds of advantages that he was exposed to are things that are not well captured in the survey which was largely designed for a more disadvantaged population. So I've just given you three examples of processes that potentially lead to irreducible error. They are consequential intervening events, measurement error, and unmeasured predictors. Now I wanna move on to give you two examples of processes that lead to learning error, then we'll wrap up, then we'll have time for some questions. So remember, irreducible error, there's nothing we can do. It's about how much variability there is within each subgroup. Now, learning error is different. Learning error is something we can potentially um, 
do better on if we have more data or use better machine learning. And it's basically how well can we estimate the mean GPA in each of these subgroups. And I wanna talk about two things we found which suggests to us that learning error is, is uh, likely to be substantial in many of these situations. So the first is conditional relationships. So conditional relationships here mean the pattern between predictors and outcomes are different for some units. Uh, so um, this is often sometimes called interactions. There are interactions between things. And so if there are interactions, then it's very hard to, if you, if you have a model, a linear model, then that doesn't know those interactions, you're not gonna capture them. If you use one of these flexible machine learning models, like random forest that tries to automatically learn the interactions, then you run into a different problem, which is that there are an enormous number of potential interactions. So with 13,000 variables, there's you know, 13,000 to two, which is like 85 million potential two-way interactions. And so without some guidance, you're not gonna be able to figure out which of those interactions are important in the number, given the number of cases we have. So let me give you an example of some of these conditional relationships. So this is case 16. Um, this is a kid and he says, I failed second grade. I was playing around and didn't really do the work. But then from that, I learned that if I put in the hard work and did my best, I could excel. So this is a kid who failed second grade. You might think failing second grade is a very good predictor for getting low grades when you're 15. For this kid, it was the opposite. So predicted GPA of 2.7, actual GPA 3.75. So why did failing second grade not have the same impact for this kid as it might have for other kids? Um, so, he says, in part, it might be the relationship with his mom. My mom kept on like going to these meetings, seeing about why I'm failing the second grade. And then at the end of the year, I got my final report card and it said that I failed. And then my mom was crying and I saw that and it kind of motivated me to work hard and not make her cry again. So here we see it's like the relationship, the predictive relationship between failing second grade and your fifth uh, year 15 GPA uh, is potentially different depending on whether you have a close relationship with your mom or not. And we saw many examples in these interviews where the same thing happened to different people and it led to very different outcomes. And we speculate that this is because there is some conditional relationship, but it's often hard to figure out what is the thing that means this particular event leads to good outcomes for some people and bad outcomes for others. So those are conditional relationships. The second is rare predictors. So I wanna talk about uh, case three. This was a low income family raised by a single mother. They experienced a lot of violence in their neighborhood. Um, at age eight, this kid met a family from out of state through a program, uh, kind of like big brothers and big sisters. It's not big brothers and big sisters, but it's, it's kind of like that. And so, uh, he really, really loved this out-of-state family, as did the mother. So the mother said, they're great. You know, they're a married couple. They have kids. They've got horses. They got a stable. They're awesome people. The youth said, this is, uh, being out there is fun. It's like paradise. That's how life should be. Um, then one of the things we asked about in our interview is we asked people to tell us if they were writing the story of their life, what would the chapters be? And so this is a very good question for getting people to think about what are the really important themes in their life. And this kid picked one of his chapters was going to be named canoe. And he said, a canoe is like your life. Have you ever been in a canoe? If you want to get to the end of a river, you've got to push with the same person. If I'm going forward and you're doing nothing, we're not going to go anywhere. If you start doing something and I'm not doing something, we're still not going to go anywhere. You can't push all by yourself. And so this kid, he had someone, he his ended up doing much better than his predicted GPA. His predicted GPA was 2.66, his actual GPA was 3.5. He may have done much better than expected in part because of this other family that was able to help him. He had someone with him uh, paddling in his canoe. And so what if every kid has their own canoe predictor? And so what do I mean by that? I mean, a predictor that is very rare, not many people have a second family who plays such a big role in their life. 
and is also very important. And so if every kid has a rare but important predictor, then prediction is gonna be extremely difficult because it's gonna be very hard to learn the relationships between these rare predictors and the outcomes. To take an extreme case, if we have only one kid in our data set who's been at this program, it's not gonna help us learn. Uh, we're not gonna be able to learn the relationship between that predictor and the outcome of interest. So we see often these rare but important predictors. So that again, gives us some sense of examples of things that may have show up in the learning error term. So again, we think of prediction error as being made up of this irreducible error and the learning error. And through these in-depth interviews, we've inductively developed some examples of social and measurement processes, which we think will lead to, to the kind of prediction error that we observed. So I wanna talk some about the limitations as I wrap up. Uh, first, given the interview and the survey data, we of course can't really learn what caused what, um, or even really what happened in each particular case. Um, sometimes there are conflicting explanations, but I would say the claims that we make about the decomposition is true. That mathematical decomposition is just a true decomposition. And the claims that we make about these measurement and life outcomes, uh, uh, the, the claims we make about these processes in some sense do not require these particular things to actually have happened exactly in the way that people told us. As long as these are, we use these as examples, existence proofs for social processes that can lead to irreducible error. Um, so given this measurement process, uh, given our research design, also we can't create an exhaustive set of processes that lead to irreducible or learning error. So these are just some that came up from, for us from reading this. Uh, nor is it possible from this design to quantitatively estimate the relative importance of the processes we identified. So you might want to know how much learning error is there in a real situation or how much of the unpredictability is caused by these consequential intervening events. We can't estimate that with this design, but it's an exciting thing to try to learn through other designs. And finally, I want to emphasize that all of our evidence comes from this single prediction task of predicting GPA using data measured in birth to not year nine with this particular data set. But speaking of this specificity, I wanna say, speculate a little bit that these processes that we described from the specific example are likely to be quite general. So any social scientist, these are things that you have likely seen in data that you've worked with as well. And so I think we should expect that similar things are likely to happen in other prediction tasks focused on life outcome for individuals. And then I wanna say a value of this framework though also is that it clarifies that there's no easy way out of this. You can't just machine learn your way out of this because of the irreducible error. And also there's a potential trade-off between irreducible error and learning error. So if your goal is to, if you wanna reduce the irreducible error, what you wanna do is probably add more predictors, which then leads you to more within group homogeneity, it brings down the within group variance. So by adding predictors, you can bring down the irreducible error, but by adding predictors, then you make the learning process more difficult. And so steps that you would take to reduce one component of this decomposition actually can lead to increases in the other component. We don't fully understand this trade-off, but I think it clarifies that, again, there is no easy way out of this problem. So uh, again, this is the result that we found in the Fragile Families Challenge, that the unpredictability of life outcomes is massive, even when using large, uh, high-quality social science data and state-of-the-art machine learning, where the only goal is to predict what will happen. Um, I want to emphasize that this is collaborative work. Uh, the Fragile Families Challenge was done with Ian Lundberg, Alex Kindle, who are both graduate students at Princeton at the time, and Sarah McClanahan, and hundreds of researchers around the world. In fact, some of you on this uh, call may have in fact been participants in the Fragile Families Challenge. There's the Million Monkeys Project, and then there's the project that's searching for the dark matter, looking for what is the origins of these unpredictability. So I wanna wrap up with some final thoughts. The first is that machine learning is not magic. I think this is obvious to people that do machine learning. It's not always obvious to people that don't. And so as policymakers are struggling to think about how to make use of this technology appropriately, I think that they need to have some realistic expectations about what's possible and what's not possible. 
Second, the common task method is a great research design for producing credible estimates of predictability. Just like experiments are great for learning about causality, the common task method is great for learning about predictability. We, in this project, did not invent the common task method, but we help uh, show what it can do for social science. And I hope social scientists will increasingly adopt this method that's very widely used in machine learning. And then finally, I think we need more empirical and theoretical work about predictability. The dominant pattern in most social data is not the predictable component that we usually focus on, it's the unpredictable component. And we really have to face that fact. This isn't the, the empirical fact is we largely ignore the biggest patterns in our data, which is the unpredictable component. And so what would it mean to take this seriously? I think what it would mean is look at how we think about causal inference. So with causal inference, there are rich theoretical frameworks to think about what causality even means. Think of the counterfactual framework or Pearl's framework with directed asymptotic graphs. And there's intense and careful work about how to make causal estimates empirically. Think about regression discontinuity designs, instrumental variables, matching, all of these things. There's a tremendous amount of work and care that goes into building up general theories and making reliable empirical estimates. And we have almost none of that about predictability in the social sciences. Um, and so I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for us to be able to ask new and important questions where predictability is the focus because that is important for both scientific and policy reasons. So I'm really happy now to answer any questions. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Matt, for uh, this is truly eye-opening and uh, sobering, I, I would say. And as you said at the end, it's, it's really important for people to, to, to remember that you can't really just machine learning your way through the, the complex questions. Um, one of the fundamental things is, do we even know where, what the ground truth is, right? And that's where the empirical work is as, you know, as important, if not more important than before. So uh, I want to remind the audience members that you can put your questions in Q&A. We have a few minutes for questions. So, um, oh, okay, so first question, can you see the can you see the question your yourself? Sure. Um, yeah. Yep. So, but let me let me repeat uh, the question. Just just uh, sure. make sure the audience members know sure. it's crucial to know it's crucial to know the difficulty oh, so by Chao Zhu Mei. Uh, it's crucial to know the difficulty of making machine learning predictions and the different sources of errors. The question is when we use these machine learning predictions for downstream tasks to answer social science questions, how accurate? is accurate enough? How much error can we tolerate? Or is accuracy the right metric even for predict predictability? Yeah, I think this is a great dependent. question. Yeah, I, I would say it's, it's almost certainly task dependent. Um, and I think a couple of ways that I think about that. So one is I think if we're using these, we wanted to ask, um, are these machine learning models more or less accurate than whatever other thing that we would be doing instead. So the decision of a judge, uh, the decision of a caseworker in child protective services. I think we would also wanna ask not just are they accurate, but are they systematically biased against certain groups of people? So concerns about fairness, I think are incredibly important. And I think in society, we know that there are issues of injustice in a lot of our processes. And if those processes are um, transparent and clear, people can challenge that injustice. And if it's all hidden away inside of a black box model that people can't interrogate, I think that's a serious problem. So I think accuracy it should be compared to whatever the alternative, the, the accuracy of machine learning can be, should be compared to whatever the alternative is. And we should also think about other metrics other than accuracy like fairness. And um, I think, it's also important that we should acknowledge that these are not perfectly accurate. So if people went into a lot of these settings and said, you know what, this machine learning is not actually really that accurate. We're just kind of doing a guess that's better than nothing. Uh, that's not what you often hear. And I think the ability to people to have realistic expectations is important. So the last thing I would like to say is we need to not just know how accurate is enough, but we need to be clear 
clearly show people the inaccuracy of these predictions. So in social science, we often like to produce confidence intervals. And I think if we produced meaningful prediction intervals that included all of the sources of uncertainty, these intervals would likely be very, very large and would likely lead people to not be as excited about using predictive models in these settings, but I don't know. And it's an important question about how do we accurately convey the uncertainty, all of the uncertainty to the people who are using these predictions. That's again in the policy setting. Next question is, do you think, uh, from Al O'Brien, do you think mm -hmm. the issues you encountered with rare predictors and conditional probabilities are related to the curse of dimensionality? Or are these separate issues? I think they're related. Um, so I think the curse of dimensionality roughly is as you get more and more predictors, the number of um, possible combinations of those gets bigger and bigger much, much faster. So the number of sub, you can think of it as like a multiplicative process, not an additive process. So adding a small number of additional variables can dramatically increase the number of groups you have. And so I think as the number of subgroups gets very, very, very large, um, then you're not going to be able to estimate the mean in each subgroup based on data from that subgroup. And so you're going to have to start doing modeling where you kind of learn about some subgroups from other subgroups. And here, I think then you run into the problem that as social scientists, we don't really have good, strong theory to tell us how to do this kind of modeling. And so then these rare predictors and conditional probability, um, conditional relationships make it such that that modeling can be uh, difficult. So I think it's the case that the curse of dimensionality means either we need a simple data generating process that, or a data generating process that we understand well. And I don't think we have either of those. Uh, next question uh, in chat is, can't theory resolve the two mechanisms underlying the learning errors, such as by identifying a more fundamental predictor that explains both pre-existing predictors and rare predictors and conditional relationships? Absolutely. Uh, and if you know what that is, definitely let us know. I mean, so I, I, I'm serious though. Like, I, I think that is what we would like to do. That is what we have been trying to do. Um, I think that is just very hard to do given the nature of the data generating process that exists in the world and given the scope of our measurements. So we did 40 in-depth interviews that took a lot of time. Analyzing that data took a lot of time. And just think, you, you're not going to learn that much from 40 interviews, right? Like the scale of our measurement uh, is not consistent, in my opinion, with the complexity of the phenomenon we're trying to study. And so there's going to be real limitations in our ability to do this. But I conditionally, I, I totally agree. This is what we would like to do. Yeah. So, um, so to be honest, I'm actually relieved that life outcomes are not very predictable because it gives people the room to room to change and room to grow. But going back to, um, I have one, one question about your the, fra the fragile families data, uh, just to understand a little bit more, um, actually two related questions. One is, uh, if you look at the out, uh, life outcomes of the, those uh, in that data set, how I would say the, the variation, is, uh, is the range of variation comparable to what you would normally expect from the general population? Just basically, you know, how, how wide your range is. That's question number one. And question number two is, um, when you find the uh, learning errors and then uh, the unpredictable predictors such as, you know, a small town with a good university, can you go back and look at the data and say, okay, how can we approximate that, for example, through zip codes and through the school rankings and so forth? Yep. Um, so one question, how does this data compare to other, um, like a probability sample yeah. um, in terms of variability? So I would say there's more occurrences of certain kinds of outcomes in our data, like there's more evictions in this data than there would be in a random sample. But I want to emphasize that all of the training and holdout data comes from this data. So this is really a measure of our, our ability to predict with this um, data generated from this process. 
it's it is a separate question, I think, whether it is easier or harder to make predictions for this population of people. That's to me is a sociological question. Are the lives of uh, the people in this study uh, more or less predictable than the lives of a random sample of children of wealthy people or a random sample of any people or a random sample of people in Sweden or China? I don't know the answer to those questions. Those are empirical questions that we could answer, um, but I don't know the answers yet. I'd like to know. Um, and then the second question is like, from what we learned in the interviews, could we go back to the data and try to develop new features that would then allow us to predict better? Is that the question? Um, just basically any feature in your, you know, you have already like 12,000 variables, right? So I would imagine, you know, some of the things would could be captured, for example, the school quality and, you know, living in a small town with a prestigious university, you can, you can see that from your zip code. And so I'm just wondering whether you see any sort of connection. Yeah. So there. I was, I was, I was thinking about, I mean, that was one of the things we were thinking about when we started doing these interviews is like, learn about the process, then go back and build better models. I'm less optimistic about that now because I think each of these things is kind of idiosyncratic. Almost every one of these stories has a different modeling fix to it. Um, I do think, I also wanna emphasize, we did not include geographic information in the data that was made available to researchers because of uh, re-identification, wanted to protect the privacy of the researchers. So, we can't go back and get geographic information. That is a big source of covariates that might change the results. Um, but fundamentally, if each of these stories is kind of unique, we could we could add 40 variables. But if, if the story applies to only a small number of kids, then it can't actually make a very big difference. Like if there are only like two kids in the whole study who live in these towns with, with lots of parents with PhDs, then even if we could predict those two kids perfectly, this total squared error is still gonna be quite high. Can't make a big difference in the total squared error. So, you know, I, I think it's hard. I, I think that um, I would like us to be able to have better ways of having intuition about when these things will work and to increase predictability and when they won't work, when there's just gonna be, it, it, when it's more sensible to kind of accept as a premise that, these things are likely to be unpredictable given the complexity of the data generating process and given the scale and resolution of our measurement process. So I don't see any more questions and we're really, we're running out of time anyway. So I want to thank you again for this, for, for this talk. It's really thought provoking. And I think this is one of the, this is typical of those studies that raises questions that are more significant than the questions that you can actually answer. Yes. So for this, right? So for this, thank you so much for sharing this and spending time. And uh, just like you, I really hope to see you in Ann Arbor too. Thank you. <laughs> right. So thank you everyone for uh, attending the seminar and we'll see you next week. <laughs>